bless you. God bless you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Is any, anybody here that was here this morning? All right, praise God. Well, bless the Lord. It's just wonderful to be here with you, and I want to thank Pastor Gary and uh, his lovely wife Kelly for their wonderful hospitality. And uh, so I always enjoy coming here, and I thank God for the conference and the privilege of being part of that. I've <clears throat> spent the last two days just spending time alone with God. I guess as I get older, I like to do that more and more all the time. And I asked the Lord for a word for this congregation. And uh, <clears throat> lately, when I travel, I, I don't bring the best of what worked somewhere else. I just come with an empty book and a concordance, and I say, God, you're God of the living word. And so give a word for your people. And I don't even ask the Lord to bear witness to it. Uh, God will, if it's true, it will bear witness to your heart. I, I don't have to tell you that I've heard from God. If I have, you will know it. The Holy Spirit will speak it to your heart. There'll be something of faith that rise in you. You'll be lifted. When you are sitting in the presence of, of God's word, there's something in your heart that lifts you from one place to a new place something deeper, farther, closer to what your life is to be in Christ. And that's what I'm believing God for, for you today. The Lord's not interested in empty words, neither am I. Where he is, there's life, there's freedom, there's liberty. I believe that. There's strength given in our weakness. So I'm going to trust the Lord for this with all my heart today. Revelation chapter 3. Please, if you'll turn there in your Bibles, if you have a Bible with you. I'm going to speak to you about the other side of the open door. The other side of the open door. It's not something I've ever really spoken on in the, in the way that I am today. But the Lord opened it to my heart, and I do thank God for that. Father, I thank you, Lord, for strength. I thank you for your power. I thank you, God, with all my heart for this congregation, for the men and women who you've gathered here today, some that are visiting. I thank you for all. Lord Jesus Christ, you have to speak to us in this generation. We're coming into a very dark time in history. But God, you promised to have a people who will be life and light, who will shine like lights in the darkness. And so, Lord, that's our inheritance. I believe that with all my heart. And so, God, speak through me. Speak to every heart. Bear witness to that which comes from your word and from your heart. God, let our hearts be quickened and alive. Give us grace to face the days we're about to face. Father, we thank you for it with all our hearts. In Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 7. <clears throat> the other side of the open door. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things says he who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and you've kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole earth to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amazing that God speaks to this group of people. Now, keep in mind, this is not just one person, but it's rather it's a whole group of believers that he is speaking to. And he's talking to them about an open door. I'm about to set before you a door. If you'll get up and you'll walk through that door, I'm going to write some things upon you. And, you know, if you don't take time to really ponder it, it looks like a mystery. What, what could it be that Jesus is talking about to this group of people. And what <clears throat> brings them into this place of such incredible promise? If realistically, this is a marvelous promise. He's telling them there's an hour of trial coming on the world, but I'm going to take you into a place, and there's something going to be written upon you, and the testimony on you is going to be so 
wonderful, so God-breathed that people who claim to have a living relationship with God but in truth don't are going to come to where you are and they're going to worship where you are and they're going to know that I have set my affection upon you. I've loved you. So what kind of people were these? Number one, he says, you have a little strength. It's amazing. They, they weren't self-exalted. They weren't proud. I think these people were realists. I think all of us start out, don't we? We're just full of, full of fluff and vinegar when we start out. We get saved and we're going to take the world on. People by the thousands are going to come to Christ. And we, we put out these grand visions of our fellowship and of ourselves. But then reality sets in. And we begin to realize we're not as strong as we thought we were. We have a little bit of strength, but it's minimal at best. And, of course, they weren't self-exalted people. They weren't the biggest game in town. They weren't proud. They came to the place of reality, basically of saying, if God doesn't do this, it's not going to get done. He says, you've, you've kept my word. You've a little strength, you've kept my word. And as best as they were able, they determined to be conformed to the word of God. It's an assumption today that I'm making that those of you who are here are honest people. And by that, I don't mean you're perfect. What I do mean is that you want to walk with God. You want to, you want, you're reading the Word of God. You see what the Word of God says that you should be. And you do desire that. You want to be honest. You want to be kind. You want to be forgiving. You want to be loving. But in yourself, you know that you don't really have the strength to do that. You tried, but you failed. You tried to forgive only to have that old grievance come back just as strong as it used to be. You want to live for God. Otherwise, why would you be here? I'm assuming you're not just here looking for fire insurance, wanting to get out of hell and wanting enough of heaven not to go to hell, but you really don't want to live for God. Well, there's no victory in that. There's no life in that. There's no truth in it, ultimately. It's an assumption that I'm making in my heart that everybody here is honest. You simply want to walk with God, but you know you don't have a lot of strength to do that. And then he says, you've not denied my name. These people had come to the place where their hope for the future was in Jesus Christ. Their hope was in his cross, his victory, his faithfulness, and his promise of new life. You and I get there eventually. It took me a long time because I was naturally stubborn and strong, and I got saved at 24, and I was going to take the world on for God. But I, I carried the cross a long way. I read the scripture, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And so I did. 13 years ran in my own strength. 13 years fasted, prayed, believed God, did some good. But at the end of 13 years, came face down in the dust with the reality of my own inability to do the things that I felt God was speaking to my heart that he was willing to do. And eventually, you and I get to the place where we realize that it's only in Jesus Christ we live this life. It's not in our victory. It's not in our strength. It's not by our power. It's not by our wisdom. It's by the victory of another. It's by Christ being willing to give us the strength and he beginning to live his life through us and we by faith becoming partakers of these incredible promises. What did Peter the apostle, apostle say? He said, we are given these exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might become partaker of his nature, of the divine nature of God. Not by might, not by power, but by the promises of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul had that secret. He understood it. We begin then to change from image to image and glory to glory. That means from what we are to what we, God has called us to be. And from a place of God's strength to a deeper place of God's strength, all by the Spirit of God and by the promises that God gives us in His Word. And so if, if you're ready for something that God wants to do in your life, you've come to the place of knowing that we don't have a lot of strength in ourselves. We have a little bit of strength, but not very much. Not enough to make the whole journey. We can run a little bit, but we can't finish. We've wanted to walk with God. These are realities that have hit the heart. I've, I have only so much strength. I do want to walk with God with all of my heart. But if I'm going to finish this journey, and if I'm going to walk it successfully, if I'm going to be a testimony, it's going to have to be the life of Christ. It's going to have to be Christ in me, the hope of glory that accomplishes. So I've not denied the name of Jesus Christ. I stand as best as I can. When you go into the next two verses in Revelation verses 9 and 10, he starts speaking about a time of trial that's going to come upon the whole world. Now, of course, that has happened historically. From time to time, various believers in Christ have found themselves in seasons of terrible trial. It happened during World War II. It's happened during the genocide in Rwanda. Seasons like this where people actually have to live this. But I believe there is a time coming 
that's going to touch the whole world. We're starting to see it. It's starting to unfold before us in this generation. You have to be willfully blind not to see it now. We're on the precipice, even in this nation, of a financial calamity. We, we know the end of running this race without the true respect of God is, is, is in sight. It's not too far down the road. The Center for Disease Control last week said the new outbreak of Ebola, they estimate, this is a fearsome disease. They estimate by January 2015, the minimum number of cases are going to be 550,000 up to potentially 1.4 million. And Ebola has the potential to become a worldwide pandemic as the influenza epidemic did in 1918. Folks, we're living on the precipice of eternity right now. This rise of militant Islam in the Middle East, this spirit of hell that seems to be un have been unleashed around the world, intent on causing world chaos so their 12th Imam can appear. But they're given the vision and the mandate as they see it of bringing the world into total disorder so that this new order as they believe it to be can come into existence. We're living in very, very dark days, my friend. Very dark days, fearful days, fearsome days. But he says to this church, I'm going to so profoundly and so sovereignly keep you. I'm going to so enable you to stand in the coming storm that many people are going to drop their powerless pretense of religion in all of its forms, and they're going to come to worship where you are. Where you are standing, they're going to come. There's going to be a people that say to people in this generation, give us a reason for the hope that is in you. Give us a reason for why you stand, why you still see something in the future, why you still have a song, why you're still so optimistic. Give us a reason for this. And Jesus himself said, they're going to come to where you are and they're going to begin to worship. But I wanna suggest that we can't get to that place until we know we can't do it in our own strength, until the stuffing is knocked out of us. May I put it that way? We've come to the end of arrogance and boasting and pride, come to the end of being, wanting to be the biggest, baddest thing on the block to tell everybody else how to do the kingdom of God. We've come to the place where we have just a little strength and we know that. We've come to the place where we still want to walk in the word of God and we know that. And we've come to the place of understanding that if anything good is going to come in my life, it's going to come through Jesus Christ in me and not through my own strength, power, wisdom, or reasoning. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I'm not, going to be, I'm not going to be the teacher and instructor of the whole body of Jesus Christ. I'm going to find that place of greatness that Jesus Christ described as being the servant of all. The greatest among you will be your servant. Oh God, we won't walk in this unless the Holy Spirit produces it within our hearts. We're not capable of it. But I thank God for this incredible grace that he's willing to give to us if we're willing to walk with him in truth. He said, an hour of trial is coming to test the whole world, and you'll be kept from it, and that it will not conquer your faith. It won't take away your power to stand as a visible testimony of what God is able to do. In verse 11, he says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one take your crown. In other words, I will not fail you. I will come to you. This is the words of Christ to this people. I'm not going to fail you. I am going to come to you. Do not let fear and fearful speech take you out of that place of trust that you have found in me. You have trusted that I'm going to do what only I can do, but don't let the fearful speech of people around you or the fears of your own heart remove you from that place. Trust in me with all your heart. Lean on me and all your ways acknowledge me, and I will direct your paths. This is what God promises. This is what his word says. I believe it with all my heart. I've lived it. I've known it. I've seen it. In verse 12, he said, He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go no, out no more. And that's incredible. I'll make him a pillar. In other words, I will cause you to stand, and through others, and through you, others will also find a place of safety and shelter. I'll make you a pillar. You know, a pillar is not exactly exciting, is it now? in the house of God. You've walked in here today, for example, and I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There are 10 pillars in this sanctuary. You probably didn't even notice them, did you, when you walked in? But I tell you, without them, the whole roof would come down on your head, and then you'd realize how valuable they really are. God says, I'm gonna make you a pillar. I'm gonna give you the power to stand. You won't be just a Sunday Christian. 
You're going to be a Monday Christian, a Tuesday Christian, a Wednesday Christian. You're not going to be among those who sort of come in and then they come in and they find faith and they, they, they get encouraged and they get all hyped up and they worship and they clap their hands and they sing the right notes and the pastor gets up and gives them a word of encouragement and suddenly their, their faith is built and they feel like they're going to stand but they go out again. They come in and then they go out and they go back out and don't even get beyond the parking lot. Then suddenly the, 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 the cares of this world and the, the, the struggles of family, the worries about provision and jobs and things in the future, turning on the news and just, just seeing this, uh, the, where the world is going, the, the fear of raising children in this generation, the, the concern of our own children struggling to even find the reality of God begins to swallow us up. And the next thing you know, the pillar is not standing anymore and can't wait to come back in the house of God to find that strength to stand. God says, I'm going to do something for you so profound. I'm going to make you a pillar that doesn't go out anymore from that place of confidence, that place of trust. You're going to have the same testimony on Tuesday and Wednesday that you have on Sunday after an altar call. You're going to walk out and you're going to be strong. And you're going to stand in the midst of this crooked generation that we're living in and you're not going to cave in in the times of calamities that you and I are going to begin to face. And I thank God for that, that through you, others are going to find the strength of God that they're going to need as well. You'd ask me the question today, are there other examples of this in Scripture? Is it just a one-time promise for a certain group of people? Now, folks, there are testimonies of this all throughout Scripture and all throughout the testimony of the history of the church of Jesus Christ. We're in, a, in, an, in an impending time of Difficulty coming, God gave strength to his people. Even in New York City, in our own church, Times Square Church, before 9-11, God spoke to us starting in the month of July. About, about, well, actually earlier than that, but it really became evident in the middle of July. And he spoke to us of a time of calamity coming into the city. We didn't understand what it was, but we did cancel our meetings. We canceled a missions conference, a women's conference, all of our guest speakers. And we just met and began to pray. And he told us from the book of Hebrew to come to the throne of grace to find help in our time of need, to get strengthened now for what was going to be coming. I remember standing in the pulpit in one service, and I said, folks, people are going to be running in the streets of New York. They're going to be terrified. You and I are not to be among them. God's telling us to get strength now, to prepare ourselves for the day coming. We're not to be found among the terrified. We're to be found standing with confidence in our heart, we're to open our arms, our homes, our houses, everything. This church, we're to pray for people. We're to feed them. We're to comfort them. And folks, the day came. And I thank God we were prepared. I thank God he had enabled us to stand. The day came when they came running down Broadway. But we were ready for them when they came. The day came when they were kneeling in the church. So far back on the aisles giving their lives to Jesus Christ, I had to ask the people one night to stand. They were creating a fire hazard in the church. So many people were wanting to give their lives to Jesus Christ. The day came when we were able to stand and people ran in and we had confidence. We knew who God was. We didn't fully understand the scope or the depth of what was going on in the city, but we knew that God had warned us and was giving us the power to stand and saw the confidence of others come and worship where we were. Folks, listen, the people were coming in from all over the world. I don't know. They're coming in from different churches and backgrounds and religions and, and forms of worship. I don't know everything that they worship, but I do know that they came in and where we were, that's where they bowed down before God in a place of confidence. And it's not that we are all strong in ourselves or, or something extra in the kingdom of God, just ordinary people who go through the same struggles that you go through and even more in some cases. People have to live through extreme hardship in the inner cities, but God gave them the power to stand. And I thank God for that with all my heart. And I saw, I lived to see this scripture fulfilled. We knew we were not stronger than others, but we wanted to be obedient to God. And we knew that that obedience could only come, that power through Jesus Christ. And he didn't fail us. And he began to work in our hearts and he began to give us the strength and courage that we needed to stand in our day of adversity. You don't need to turn there, but I want to talk for a moment about the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts chapter 27. The Apostle, remember John, Jesus said through the, John in the book of Revelation to the church of Philadelphia, he says, I'm going to write on you the name of my God. 
Now think about Paul in the middle of the storm. When this society of 276 people decided to abandon the word of God, just like we have done in America, pushed away the word of God, decided to take our own journey and even craft our own sense of religiousness, asking God to bless this journey. Even though there's a clear warnings in scripture, it's not going to end well. Still, we persisted in taking this journey. And Paul, representing the word of God, was marginalized. and He was, he was confined to slavery, basically, in the belly of the ship. And he was among the prisoners, which is exactly what this generation has done to the true voices of God, to that which stands and represents the testimony of Christ. And yet, <clears throat> when everything began to fall apart, when people began to be afraid, suddenly, it says in Acts 27, verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them. After a long time of America having put away the voice of God and gravitated to its own forms of religion, suddenly, in desperation, people are now willing to hear the voice of God again. And this man, Paul, stands in the midst of a perishing moment in history, but he doesn't stand as a judge, and he's not rubbing people's noses in their sin and their failure. He's a man who has the title of God written upon him, the name of God. Remember in Philadelphia, he says, I'll, I'll write upon you the name of my God. Now, God has many names. God's holy. God is righteous. God is just. God is powerful. God cannot be mocked. There's all kinds of names that you could attribute to God, but I want to remind you of something. When King David was given the pattern of the temple in the Old Testament that would literally house the tangible physical presence of God on the earth, David gave that pattern to Solomon. Solomon built the temple. And the scripture says when the singers and the musicians were of one accord singing one song of worship in that temple, the glory of the Lord came down so powerfully that nobody could even stand to minister. God had come into the temple. I've often said it's the only song in the Bible that God wrote about himself, and they were singing it. And you know what the song was? God is good, and his mercy endures forever. God is good, and his mercy endures forever. God is good, and his mercy endures forever. When they began to sing that song, the glory of the Lord came down. And yes, our society has failed, and yes, we've done atrocious things, and yes, people are living and doing things and guiding their families in a direction that is destructive. But you and I are going to be given a song one day soon. And people are going to come and that song is going to be, God is good and his mercy endures forever. God is good. God is willing to forgive. Yes, judgment is coming and we justly deserve it. But we have crafted our own path to our own judgment. But in the midst of it all, I remind you that mercy triumphs over judgment. God is good. Paul said, I urge you to take heart, for there shall be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Thank God for a voice of mercy in the midst of the storm. Thank God. You see, God had written his name on Paul. The name of God is the name of mercy. He told the people, you shouldn't have taken this journey, but now I urge you to take heart. In other words, be of good cheer. There shall be no loss of your life if you will trust the words that I speak to you. This is going to be your testimony in the days ahead. You shouldn't have done this, but be of good cheer now, for if you will listen to me, you're going to be safe, and your family is going to be safe, and God will put his arms around you and give you a way to, to find a way to safety in the midst of this difficult time we're living in. And he says, I'll write upon you the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to write upon you a name of faith. Not only mercy, but faith. Faith to believe that what God says he's going to do, that's what God's going to do. Not what I think, not what I feel, not what society says. I don't live by this. I don't walk by this. I don't see this. But I believe what God says is what he's going to do. New Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven. The Son of God is going to rule and reign from there. I believe that with all of my heart. Paul said, For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. 
You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those that sail with you. Take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. You see, Paul had the name of the city of God, which is faith, the faithfulness of God. I've been in God's presence, Paul said, and I believe that it will be just as God has told me. I thank God for that with all my heart. And then Jesus says, and I will write on him my new name, or her, my new name. And what is that new name of God? The only name I can think of is victorious. It's the name of Christ means victory. The name of Christ is strength. The name of Christ is triumph. The name of Christ is entering into the victory of another. The name of Christ is being seated at the right hand of God. He being the head, we being the body, and he is the fullness of the one who fills all in all. The name of Christ means I'm already with him at the right hand of God. I'm already more than a conqueror, as the apostle Paul said. The name of Christ means that no matter what comes against me, tide, flood, victories, devils, endless armies, no matter what comes against me, nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is mine in Christ Jesus. I am loved of God. I am loved of God. I, I might only have a little strength, and I might desire to live the word of God, and I, in myself I'm not finding the strength to do it, but I'm not a hypocrite. I'm sincere. God knows I'm sincere, but he's going to set his love upon me, and the image of that love, the, the, the definition of that love is that I'm going to have strength to stand in the coming days, not in my strength, but in the strength of God within me. I'm going to be victorious in Christ, and my testimony is going to be of him, not of myself, not of seven steps to this or 14 steps to that, but I took one step to the cross of Jesus Christ, and his death and resurrection became my victory. His promises are my hope. His life is my life, and everywhere he leads me, I will follow him. By God's grace, I look forward to going through every open door he sets before my life. He says in verse 35 of Acts 27, and when he had said these things, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Now, I have to picture this with me. This storm is a mammoth storm. The waves are higher than the ceiling in this auditorium. They're about to break in pieces a ship, an ocean-going ship, that has the capability of transporting at least 276 people plus cargo. This is no small boat. This is a hefty vessel. But it's, it's, in, it's in disrepair. It's in danger of being destroyed now. The sails are in tatters. People are hanging on to the railing. Hope is gone. The despair of arriving at the journey has finally overwhelmed them. The myriad of opinions about everything are, have come to nothing. And now there's this one man, Paul. Historians say he was about five foot seven. I don't know that for sure, but that's what I've read. And Paul He's not an imposing figure by any stretch. He doesn't, he doesn't have the physique of a warrior. There's nothing in, his, in him into the natural eye that should inspire confidence in men. But Paul takes a loaf of bread, breaks it in two, and in the middle of that ship lifts it up to God. And God writes upon him the new name of Christ, the name of victory. And Paul is giving thanks to God, one of the more profound communion services next to the Last Supper in the entire Bible, where he alone is giving thanks to God I don't know exactly what he said, but it's, oh, thank you that your word is true. Thank you that you're going to save these people. Thank you, God, that as we follow you, our steps are sure and guided. Thank you we're going to come to a desired end. Thank you, God. It's not in our strength, but in your strength this is going to happen. And the scripture says, and they were all encouraged and took some food themselves. Remember, Jesus said, I will make those who think they have a relationship with God, but don't. I will make them to come and worship where you are. And suddenly you see all of the, you see the captain, you see the officers, you see the, the fellow prisoners and thieves and centurions. Everybody is moving towards Paul, a man who has gone through an open door and found the confidence that only God is able to give to us. Praise God. He's not the strongest. His strength is in God. You read the writings of Paul. Paul knew that in himself he was nothing. Paul knew that he was the chiefest of sinners. That's what he called himself. He knew that in him dwelt no good thing. He knew that. But he also knew that he had found the strength of another. He also knew that he had entered into the victory of one who had gone before him and conquered the power of sin and confusion and death and hell and everything that comes with it. And he walked in the strength of God. 
Hallelujah. I'll make them come and worship before you. I'll make them come. Folks, if you will walk with God, if you will go through this open door, I'm telling you there's a day coming. Your neighbors, your coworkers, as they see the news and things get more fearful and more fearful, they begin to realize that this society is falling apart all around us. They're going to come to you, not because you have it all together. They're going to come to you because you have a source of strength, and it will be a source of strength that can be seen with the natural eye. Your children will come. They'll ask for a reason for the hope that is still in you in the midst of this perishing time that we're living in. Oh, I believe with all my heart the greatest days of the church of Jesus Christ are just ahead of us. I do believe that. If your value system is in your retirement plan, then the greatest days for you are not before you. But if your value system is in God's glory, God's name being glorified in the earth and the souls of men finding him as Savior, then the greatest days of the church of Jesus Christ are just ahead. What an awesome day it's going to be to see the house of God filled with people again, seeking and finding the truth of Jesus Christ. Now the scripture says he overcomes. He overcomes. I'll, make, I'll write upon him. He will go no more out. I'll make him a pillar. I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down from heaven, from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. He overcomes what? He overcomes the fear of going through the open door that God set before them. And this is the thing that you and I have to face, the fear that does God really mean me in my littleness, in my fear, in my struggles, in my trials? I only have a little bit of strength. As best as I know, I've lived by the word of God. I've tried to. But I will not deny that Jesus is calling me to himself. And he's offering me a place of strength and confidence in what he is able to do in and through me. These people who overcome the fear that God can't possibly mean me. It can't possibly be me that he wants to give a testimony to in strength. The one thing I don't see myself as being is a pillar in the temple of God. Pastor Gary, maybe he's a pillar. Maybe some of the elders are pillars. The guest speakers, they're pillars. Oh, I know brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, but it can't be me. But you see, to the church of Philadelphia, he said, no, I'm talking to everybody. There are no exclusions in this. Whoever wants to get up and go through the door, I'm going to give you strength, but it won't be yours. It'll be mine. And thank God you've come to the place of knowing that you need his strength, that you need his power, that you need the character of God the life of God within you, because none of us can do this in our own strength. Folks, listen, the greatest revelation you'll ever get is that there are no big people and little people in the kingdom of God. It's the hungry heart that gets the victory. Let the Pharisees scratch their beards and theologically debate everything. But the leper, the prostitute, the lame man, the blind man are all pressing through and they're getting the miracles of God. It's always been that way in every generation. Don't try to reason it all. You just get up and go through the door. Say, if this is what God is promising, then this is where I'm going. I'm not going to live in weakness when God's offering me strength. I'm not going to run around among the confused, just wringing my hands, say, oh, God, look what's coming on the world. I'm going to stand. I'm going to break bread in the presence of God. Say, Lord, thank you. You've given me the privilege of being abandoned for your purposes on the earth. You've guided it my every step. Lord, you have a plan for my life, and not just for me, but for everybody who will believe the words that you put in my heart to speak to them. I'm not going down in weakness. I'm not going to be among those who, whose faith is only when they're in church on Sunday. I'm not going to go out and get weak again. I'm going to walk out in the strength of God, and I'm going to be a pillar in the temple of God all day, all week, all month, for the rest of my life. I'm not going out again. And this is what God promises, to give us the strength that's not conditional on our environment. It's not conditional on the exuberance of the preacher. It's not conditional on anything other than Christ in you, the hope of glory. He says, I'm, gonna, I'm setting before you an open door. Didn't he say in the Gospel of John, I am the door. By me, people will go in and out and find pasture. He is the door. There is no other door. He says, I'm, I'm opening my heart to you. I'm opening my life to you. I'm opening to you the strength that I give to the weary, to the weak, to the marginalized, to the nobodies, the nothings. 
I'm going to give you strength to stand that the glory might be of God and not of man. Don't set yourself on the sidelines. Believe it or not, you're a star player in this game called life, in the presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't just pay your ticket and sit on the sidelines like they do in a professional game. When you are called, your first line, you're called to go in in the strength of God. You're called to stand as a light and a testimony in a darkened day. By grace alone, I'm going to go through to a place where I stand and believe God no matter what my eyes see around me. I walk the streets of New York some days. As God lives, it looks like an immoral zoo. What's happening in the streets of our city. But I don't live by what I see with my eyes because I know that God could breathe on New York City and put the whole city on its knees in a moment of time. Now I live by something deeper than what my eyes see and what the report around me is. I see him. I see him everywhere I turn. I see him everywhere I look. And the cry of my heart now is Jesus Christ. In the latter part of my life, I read in the word of God that you save the best wine for the end and that the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And so now that my natural strength is gone and my natural zeal can only carry you so far, I'm believing God. Now that the wine is run out and the glory of the latter, the former house has dissipated, I'm trusting now that the wine that you're going to bring in is going to be better than what was there before. And the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former. And so many of us had plans and we had a dream and we had visions and we had a sense of what our life was going to be. And then it just ran out. Just the wine is gone. They're out of wine. The glory dissipated and it just came back and it just looks like a regular old building now. But God promises that he sets before each of us an open door and his life can become ours once we've given up and once our own natural strength is gone, but we still retain that inner desire to see his name glorified in the earth. He promises he'll come to us again and give us a strength and a testimony that only God could have done this. See, that's my testimony today. I thank God for yesterday. It's been some great travel, some great crusades. It's been an awesome journey, but I'm living in the place now where I say only God could have done this. Only God could do this. The testimony is not to be of ourselves. It's to be of him. We're just vessels through whom he chooses to manifest his glory. That's all, that's all we are. And we're equal. I know this more than I know life and breath. There are some great evangelists in this room. You just don't even know what you are because you've never been willing to get up and go through the door. There's some great testimonies in your workplace, in your community. No, not everybody will preach to thousands, but I promise you, everybody will preach to somebody. Your life will be a testimony. You'll stand. I see the day coming when your, your children are going to come to you. The ones that are waffling in and out of the kingdom of God or, or mocking the whole thing, they're going to come. Mom, Dad, where do you get the strength to stand? Where, where do you get the strength to sing? Where do you get the strength to break bread in the middle of this storm? And you'll be able to say, son, daughter, you follow the words that God's given me. And I promise you, you'll have life. I promise you, God will keep you. He will never fail you. He'll never forsake you. People who mock you in your workplace are going to come and ask for a reason for the hope that is in you. Because you and I are going into the darkest days of history that perhaps in our generation we've ever known. Hallelujah. I don't really mind it, to be honest with you, because I've often said I'd rather go to heaven hungry than hell full. And if it takes a little bit of hunger to reach this generation, so be it. Because my value system is not in retaining. God has blessed me, thank God. But I've seen things come and I've seen them go. And I've never seen a, a hearse with a U-Haul. Have you ever seen one? I've never seen one. I can't take any of the natural possessions in this life with me, but I can take you with me. And I can't take my sons, and I can't take my daughter, and I can't take my grandchildren. I can take my nieces. I can take my nephews. I can take my two brothers. I can take my sister. I can take my family with me. And I can take a multitude of souls, but all the rest of it stays behind. Glory to God. I will go through the door to a place where my confidence and the ability of God to keep me is forever settled. And I will go no more out. I will go through the door. There's a point in every life where we just say, I trust God. I trust you, Lord. Whether I see it or I don't, 
I trust you. You have ordered my steps, so I'm not here by accident. I'm not in this place by happenstance, and I haven't gotten a hold of the short end of the spiritual stick. You brought me to this place. Remember the scripture says, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies. I was in Times Square Church in 1994, 95, 96, when there was a tremendous uprising that happened there. I don't need to go into the reasons, but just suffice to say it happened. And I remember people leaving in droves and saying, Ichabod, the glory of the Lord has departed. Nothing good is ever going to happen here. This church will be gone. It will be finished. It will be destroyed. Yet, I mean, we're still there. 1,200 people a year coming to Christ. Testimony that God gave is going out now across the nation. We're still there. Unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. The one thing that trouble and trial will do is it knocks the spiritual stuffing right out of you, which is a good thing. All of the, you know, every bending rooster gets all his, his tail feathers clipped off. And suddenly we have nothing to strut. We've got nothing to put forward to the people. We've got nothing to hope in. But the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary, and that's where it all should have began in the first place. I will go no more out. I will no longer walk in confidence on Sunday and crisis on Tuesday. No more. I trust God. It's settled in my heart. And every great man or woman of God, or every man or woman who's ever made the name of God great in the earth has come to that place in their life. I simply trust God. I don't need to look to my circumstance. I'm not looking in the mirror for strength or a diploma on the wall. I will simply trust God. And it's settled in my heart forever. I'm going to the other side of the open door. I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk through. And I'm going to believe God that he will use my life for his good and for his glory in the future. And I'm asking God to write on me his name. A name of faith, a name of mercy, a name of victory. God, let that be the testimony of my life for the rest of my days. I thank God for that with all my heart. Father, I thank you. Lord Jesus Christ, that you are the one who gives the word and we're not responsible for making it happen. I thank you for that knowledge. I thank you, God, that when we know we just have a little strength, but we do want to live for you. And you promise to take us through an open door where you write the name of God, the name of the city of God, and the new name of Jesus Christ on us. Oh, Jesus, I thank you, God, for making this so real and so simple to our hearts. I thank you for the simplicity of Christ. Now I know why Paul said, I fear lest you be converted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Oh, I praise you and I bless you, God, that it's Christ in us, the hope of glory, that is our strength. I pray for this church, Father. I pray for those that are visiting today. Oh, God, I ask you, Lord Jesus Christ, to do something so profound. Give us such strength. Plant us so deep in confidence in you that God Almighty, in the days ahead, men and women from this congregation will stand like pillars of God in their community, unmoved, unshaken by the news, a confidence in their voice, a bounce in their step, something of glory and joy in their song. Father, I thank you for this God with all my heart. I praise you for men and women in this congregation and young people who will get up and will go through the door and say, I'm coming to you, Jesus. I'm coming in my littleness. I'm coming in my weakness. I'm coming with all I've got, but I'm going through that door and I'm trusting you're going to write upon me the things that I need. And it's going to be your hand that does this, not mine. It's going to be grace that does it. It's going to be your goodness. It's going to be your victory I enter into, not my own. There'll be no boast of myself. My boast will be of you, Lord Jesus Christ, and all you have done for me. God, I thank you for this with all my heart. Jesus, Son of God, be glorified. Be glorified. You prayed that. You said, Father, glorify thy name. And a voice came from heaven and said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And so, Lord, we say the same words to you. Glorify your name. God, glorify your name. Write it upon us, O oh God. Give us strength, Lord, that we could never have in our natural abilities. Give us, O oh God, mercy that comes from your heart, a love that casts out fear. Give us, God, faith in your word, faith in your finished work. 
faith in the promises that you've made to us, God. Lord, God, that gives us rest. Help us, Lord. For you yourself said that you came to give rest for our souls, Lord. You said your yoke is easy and your burden is light. That is your word, God. Lord, we believe that. We stand in that, Lord. We don't try to alter that or change that or add to that. That is sufficient in itself, Lord. Oh, God, give us the victory. Give us the understanding of it in our hearts. Guide us into the strength of that victory. Each one of us, Lord, young and old, rich and poor. Oh, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus, Son of God, be glorified in your church. Be glorified, oh, God. Make us servants to the body of Christ, not lords, not instructors. Give us a servant's heart. For you yourself said the greatest among you will be your servant. Make us servants in our homes, to our wives, to our husbands, God, to our children. Help us, oh God. Be a demonstration of who you are through us, God, to our own families. Help us in the workplace, Lord, to do right, to live right, to speak right. God, make us a pillar in that place, no matter who is doing what. No matter the chaos, the confusion, the breakdown around us, you promised that you would make us pillars in the temple of God and we would go no more out. Oh God, I thank you for that with all my heart. Oh Jesus, Son of God. For young people, I pray for courage in the school system where the name of Jesus is now mocked and vilified. I ask you, God Almighty, for a song and joy inexplicable apart from the inner life of Christ not based on anything else, but a living relationship with God. Oh God, oh God, I thank you for this, Lord, with all my heart. I thank you, God, with everything in me, Lord Jesus Christ. I praise you, God. I bless you, Lord. If you want to go through, you, you can't make this an empty religious exercise because there'd be no point to it. But if you want to go through, you, you just, you might be the weakest Christian in this room and you know it. Actually, that puts you at an advantage if you understand the scriptures. Because you're not going to bring anything of yourself now. You're just going to come and receive what God has for you. You might have less than a little strength, but you say, God, I'm just tired of collapsing between services. I want to stand. Write upon me those names that you promised this, this little church, not the biggest deal in town, but just this little church. You promised it to them. So God, I'm coming to, I'm going to walk through. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to walk through this door and I'm believing that you're going to do something in my life. Your hand's going to write on me. Your hand is going to change me. Your promises are going to become my life. We're going to stand in just a moment, and if, if that's the cry of your heart today, I'm going to ask you just to get out of your seat and come and just join me here at the front of this auditorium, and we're going to pray together. We're going to believe God. Let this be the door. Let the end of the aisle be the door, and just in your mind, just say, I'm, I'm getting up, and I'm going through. I'm coming through in all my weakness, all my struggles and trials, and all my failure, and I'm not going to sit on the sidelines any longer. God promised to make me a pillar and I will no longer go out. If that's the cry of your heart, let's stand together. Just come, please. Just slip out of wherever you are. And let's take a moment. We're going to worship and pray together and believe God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. My God, bless your holy name. Can you sing Amazing Grace? Do you guys know Amazing Grace? Let's give it a try.
Hallelujah. He is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. He is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. Sing it with me now. He is all I need. Yes, he is. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. He is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all. I need, sing it again, he is all I need, he is all I need, Jesus is all I need, he is all I need. He is all I need. Jesus is all I need. You know, the beauty about the time we're living in now is that, you know, people are, are not looking for flash and dance anymore. There was a season of peace, I guess, in, in America where you know, people were coming to the church, and they're all just looking for like a big show. But those days are over now. Everything's coming to a halt. And what people are looking for is just solidness. Is this thing real? Does it work? Will it give me peace? Will it give me strength in, in my home, my family, where I live, in my world? They're not looking for flash and dance. Those days are finished. Just solidness. Solidness. And it, God has only ever had one testimony. It's people like you and me. That's all. There's no, no time for any more big name preachers. That day is over. It's going to be the whole church now. You and me just standing in our communities. You and me just being Christians wherever God sends us and standing in the strength of God. Our, we don't have to, we just, we don't have to know every theological argument. We just have to be able to say, look, I, I'm telling you what God's done for me can do for you. Isn't that amazing, isn't it? It just, it just comes down to that. And we're seeing more people saved New York, New York City in the, than in the history of the church just with the simplest of messages. What God's done for me, he'll do for you. I'm not perfect, but he's given me the power to stand. And he'll give you the power to stand. Paul said, if you'll listen to these words, you're going to get wet, but you'll be safe. There's going to be lots of wood around in just a few moments. Everybody can grab onto the cross of Christ. The cross still floats, folks. The cross still floats no matter what's going on. In this society, it doesn't matter how deep the storm gets, the cross still floats. You hang on to it, and you're going to be safe. Thank God. And that will be your message. I thank you, Lord, for these people at this altar. I thank you, God. You said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? So, Lord, you won't withhold from us. God, when we come to you with an honest heart and we accept your invitation to strength, you're not going to withdraw your hand. You died to give us strength. You died to give us victory. You came to get us, but you left us as a testimony of who you are. And so, Lord, we're simply asking to be that testimony, that we may stand as pillars of God in our communities, our homes, our schools, our colleges, our workplace, the, the employment place or the unemployment line, wherever we are, that we might stand as pillars of God's power, God's faithfulness as a testimony of life and light. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you are preparing us for this moment in history. You don't let it overtake us like a thief. We're not children of darkness. We're children of light. God, thank you for grace. Thank you for strength, God. Thank you, Lord, that there are going to be testimonies. Men and women are going to come into this house and leap and dance in the presence of God, not because they're being souped up one more Sunday, 
But they're coming in and say, I gotta tell you what God did through my life this week. I wanna tell you where God took me. I wanna tell you the words God gave me. People will come in to say, thank you, Lord. God Almighty, I just come here not to be strengthened. I come here to give you thanks for the strength that you've given me. God, I praise you for this. Bless you, Lord. Bless you for these men and women at this altar, young and old, who will no longer go out and cave in under the pressures of this world. Oh, Jesus, I thank you with all my heart. I ask you for the blessing of heaven to be upon this congregation. Lord God, you gave Pastor Gary a vision that one day <laughs> these seats would be filled with people looking for safety, security, looking for a word from heaven. Lord, you don't give a vision and not fulfill it. We thank you for that, God. We bless you, Lord, for making us dependent on you. We bless you, God, for showing us that we're not as strong as we thought we were. We bless you, God, for giving us hearts to want to obey you and to live godly in this generation. But we bless you the most for the victory of Jesus that has become ours, for the open door to life that you've set before us. God, we will go through. We will not tarry outside. We will not stand around and try to debate it in our hearts. We simply get up by the grace of God. We go through this door, and we believe that our lives will make a difference in this, in this society we live in today. Father, we thank you for it. We praise you for it. In the mighty, unmatchable name of Jesus, God Almighty, God Almighty, we thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Can you give him a shout of glory in this house? Can you give him a shout of victory in this house? Does your soul feel refreshed, church? Do you feel like he's filled you with the courage and the power of the Holy Spirit? And then Monday's going to be the best Monday you've ever had. You're not going to go out from the things that he's spoken over you today. So I bless the Lord for that. Uh, if you're a guest here, we'd love just to meet you at our Connect Center. And also men and women sign up today. Don't leave without giving at least five people a nice big hug. Tell them you love them and Jesus loves you. God's blessing to you. Grace and peace to you. Have a wonderful afternoon. You're dismissed.